Hello, everybody. I'm Frank Sesno, and welcome to what I like to call Studio 1A. It's in my home here, and some other time we'll be together. But for now, these virtual uh, uh, virtual salons allow us to bring an audience in from around the world, which is exactly what we're doing, for a conversation today, a Planet Forward Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations Salon, High Tech, Next Gen, the Future of Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, this is another in our Planet Forward FAO partnership looking at sustainable agriculture and how we feed the planet now and in the future. And it's a way for us also to celebrate the work of the students who are Planet Forward FAO fellows over this last year, working on stories, researching, talking to people in the world of agriculture and sharing those stories across our platforms with a larger audience. So much is changing. There are huge challenges out there, but there are also enormous opportunities. And this is what we're going to talk about today, putting it in the context of the next generation. I would be remiss if I were not to start with one of the challenges that we face, a very serious one and a very uh, contemporaneous one. The crisis in Ukraine, military action there, which could prompt not just a humanitarian crisis, but also a longer term uh, disruption to global food supplies. Ukraine is, after all, a, one of the breadbaskets of the world, supplying wheat and other things to Eastern Europe, the Middle East. Longer term, there's not only the issue that we see now and in the future in Ukraine and in other conflict zones around the world, but other challenges that are pressing. Climate change is one of them. Uh, and how farmers use technology, that's an opportunity. How we bring new generations into this uh, remarkable career, profession, craft, calling, uh, that's another opportunity. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're very pleased to be partnering with FAO to host this conversation. And as I mentioned, we have um, an audience around the world. We'd like to welcome you. We'd also like to invite you to put your questions in. We want to engage you and engage your thoughts in this conversation as we go. So as we do, please use the chat and, and, and do that. We'll talk about a number of things, how youth are getting involved. We're gonna hear from a couple of innovators and communicators in this field as we ask, how do we ensure that youth have a seat at the table when it comes to the future of agriculture? And how do we tell those stories so that others know, are inspired and motivated by that? We'll look at a couple of real life case studies, as I say, about how people are using technology um, to address crop yield, food security, that kind of thing. I'd like to welcome and introduce our panelists, starting with Mustafa Diol Hag. Uh, Mustafa is a young Ghanaian entrepreneur working on AI, artificial intelligence, in health and in agriculture. Hi, Mustafa, how are you? Hi, Frank, um, I'm doing very well and I'm glad to be here. Well, we're delighted you're here. I'll tell the audience a little bit more about you. You taught yourself how to code. You started building apps for your friends in class and elsewhere, went on to build a machine learning model for cancer detection of all things. And you started a foundation. What's the name of the foundation? Um, the name of my foundation is Sokwe Full Foundation based in Ghana. And its its purpose, its focus is what exactly, Mustafa? Um, we are, so currently we are focused on helping uh, small scale small scale farmers um, reduce um, their losses, which are mainly caused by pests. Yeah. Great. So we're going to talk lots about that. So I'll come back and introduce our next panelist. Our next panelist is Bev Flat. And Bev joins us from, well, let me ask you, Bev, where are you joining us from? <laughs> so you're here in my studio on Flat Rock Farms. We are a diversified livestock operation in the state of Tennessee, which is the southern part of the United States for anybody uh, joining around the world who needs some uh, refresher on geography. Uh, there's, there we go. And sometimes I need a refresher on geography, so I'm glad to know where you are. <laughs> and as I understand it, you operate a, about 170 acre family farm with you and your husband and you've um you produce beef cattle you have dairy goats hay a bunch of other things and i think you told me you have a new crop of goats or something going on what's that <laughs> we do so we're in the middle of kidding season with all of our goats so i'd imagine that people will follow our social handles after this panel and if you do you're going to see tons of pictures of baby goats we have about 40 and counting in the season so far that's great Finally, I'd like to invite Alina Gerka to join us. Uh, she's our third panelist here, and she brings a really fascinating global perspective from the Food and Agriculture Organization. Hello, Alina. Hi, Frank. Hello, everyone. Very excited to be here today. 
Wonderful to have you. And you are a communications and outreach specialist at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. What is that? What do you do? Yeah, well, basically, I make sure that people outside of the organization know what we are doing. And we're also working very closely um, with the countries and regional offices to help them to foster their communication and to also communicate with the different governments in the countries. Now, I understand you work in the forestry department and you also serve as a communication focal point for that and, and, and other programs. Um, also bringing together the Office of Climate Change, Environment and Biodiversity. Is that right? Yeah, I used to work for the Office of Climate Change, and now I'm working for the Forestry Department. But as you know, all the concerns we are facing today are intertwined, and obviously also our forests and drylands are um, hardly impacted by, by climate change. Exactly. Yeah, well, let's, let's get on with it then. Um, just a couple of things, just so the audience knows, some of the things we're gonna, we want to look at in this conversation is some of the challenges and solutions that each of you see um, to this, this issue of youth bringing young people into agriculture, sustainable agriculture and technology. Um, how do we assure that seat at the table that we talk about for, for young people? What are the barriers to entry uh, and what are some of the opportunities? Just a little bit of kind of contextualizing here. Um, we you know, currently are producing enough food to feed everybody uh, on, the, on the planet, um, but still there are over 800 million people who are hungry or food insecure. And that number is growing. Uh, and meanwhile, we've got an aging cohort who is doing the farming uh, around the country. I mentioned that we have students um, who've been working with Planet Forward and FAO as our fellows. There are student storytellers. And uh, they worked up a series of stories uh, on food. I've shared some of these in our previous salons. But one I'd like to draw to your attention now comes from one of our students from Emerson College here in the United States. Jules Struck is her name. And she, her story, as you can see here, is called um, Dollars and Diversity and uh, Why Young Farmers Need Investments and Representation. And the, the, she writes the following. She um, focuses on Decker Woods. That's a young man you see in the picture there standing off to the side. Thanks, Victoria. She's scrolling up and down for us here. But um, uh, Jules writes as follows. Decker Woods was elbow deep in a bin full of kale. He was boxing up an order for a local juicery, one of a few business deals he set up as a new urban farmer. He only got into the trade nine months ago. He's also a rapper and a video editor, all work that makes up his income. Here's a great quote. It's really healing to be able to tend to a space where food comes from, he said, shoveling fistfuls of leafy greens into bins. You put love in and you get love out. Now, Woods, as this story points out, he's 24 years old, part of a nonprofit urban, urban farming program in Omaha, Nebraska, another U.S. state in the upper Midwest, called the Big Muddy Urban Farm, which houses young farmers rent-free and gives them $10,000 and a few urban plots to get them launched, and then they get on to growing. So let's pull the story down now, Victoria, and let me go to, to the panel. And, and Mustafa, I'd like to start with you. This is an interesting story about a young urban farmer in the United States and his barrier to entry and what they're trying to do with this pilot project there is provide basically seed funding, if I can call it that, to get him going. Where you are in Ghana and Africa and working with the young farmers you know, is this a universal story in terms of access to capital and to the resources needed? Or are the principal barriers in your part of the world something different? Yeah, um, thanks, Fran. I think the barriers are definitely different. Um, in Ghana here, um, where I am, the government has initiatives um, similar to what, what you mentioned being in the story. But then these funds and opportunities are really difficult to come by. So a lot of um, people, young people wanting to get into agriculture have to fend for themselves. Um, acquiring land isn't um, an easy uh, process here. You have to it's it stuck between um, the local chiefs and then um, the government and families and private individuals as well. So um, I think th that is um, the main concern here. Um, access to funds, it's really um, not that easy for a lot of young families in Ghana and access to land and resources as well isn't, um, 
very easy to come. Mustafa, tell us, and, and we're getting a couple of hits to your to your uh, to your, your Wi-Fi there, but that's okay. We can live with that. Uh, tell us your story. How did you get involved? How did you get interested first in farming and agriculture, and then the technology side of things, and then we'll start to move it around. Yeah. So. Um, I, I got interested in farming um, from a couple of experiments we did in school. Um, we planted maize in, in, in cans. And I brought in solid, you know, grow, 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 and it, it eventually died. So I started um, backyard farming in our house, um, in our family house where we used to live. Um, so I started that and I got a couple of yields and that was, you know, really um, inspiring for me. And then now growing up and, you know, taught myself how to code and started looking for opportunities in what areas I could impact, which um, I started with healthcare. Um, I saw the number of, you know, cases we, we had of breast cancer in Ghana and the number of radiologists in Ghana was like really low compared to, you know, the, the ratio was, you know, really, really bad. And I thought of, you know, coming up with something that can, that can make it simpler. So we did, I did some research with my colleagues and we came up with a machine learning model that can, um, you know, analyze um, data from radiologists and it's able to be able, it's able to predict whether um, a case is malignant. And then from there, um, throughout my work in teaching young people how to code, we used to travel a lot to, you know, rural communities with our initiative, um, teaching young kids how to code. The initiative on the Ghana Code Club was called Code on Wheels. So it was, yeah. Code, code on wheels, is that what you said it's called? Yeah, yeah. That's great. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, now, so, me, um, during, mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So during one of these trips, um, we, we went to a farming community and I saw the situation there. The, the kids looked malnourished and I was really baffled. I was like, you know, we live in the city and we know food comes from here. So why, uh, you know, why is the situation here like this? And speaking to a few farmers, we got to realize they're putting a lot of hard work, but then they don't get that in return. And it was due to a number of factors. And one of them was um, pests, um, pests, you know, and, and diseases. And then so we, we, we decided to um, tackle that since, you know, we had some experience building um, the machine learning model, you know, which was, you know, classification, you know, um, a case was banana or malignant. So we applied the same principle into, you know, detecting whether a crop was infected or not with the aim of helping farmers um, detect infestations at an early stage. Yeah. So can I just, can I just ask you, Mustafa, you, you, you're bringing together sort of technology and machine learning and artificial intelligence with, what, like, were you in school when you just started all of this? I mean, where did the, like, how old are you? Yeah, um, I just turned 21 a couple of days ago. You just ago. turned 20? uh, 22, sorry, a couple of days ago. <laughs> okay, well, happy birthday. Yeah, 22. So you've done all this by the time okay. you're 22. Now, are you a farmer as well? Yeah, yeah, I'm a farmer as well. Um, I have a mango farm and currently preparing some land for me as well, yeah. Okay, this is great. So you, you, we, we've got a, a really good sense of, of where you're coming from and some of the barriers to entry uh, and some of the challenges in that part of the world. Bev, let's, let's come over to you. Not only are you a farmer, um, and you've told us a little bit about your operation, but you also work with Bear and you, you work with sort of a global communications thing. So I know you come in contact with a lot of uh, young farmers all the time. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us what, what you see as some of the principal barriers to entry when we talk about young people who want to get into agriculture like Mustafa has done. Thanks, Frank. I think it's a really interesting question and it's going to vary from farmer to farmer and from region to region. But I think there's a few trends that we're able to look at when it comes to people who are looking to get involved in the industry and get involved in running a farm. Um, I'm not a, I'm not from a farming background. My parents were both high school teachers and I actually fell in love with agriculture because of the Burger King chicken whopper, which is a very different story I'd be happy to go into later. But I don't know if we can wait till later. <laughs> so the burger the burger wait wait wait. The Burger King chicken whopper got you into farm. It is. So my first job when I was 13 was babysitting. 
And the man that I babysat for um, invented or created the spice palette that went into the chicken whopper at this fast food restaurant. And at 13, I thought he had the coolest job in the world. He got to eat for a living. He got to travel all over the world. I thought of him every single time I went through a drive through And so when I was trying to figure out what do I want to do with my life, I thought that's for me. So when I asked him, what do I have to do in order to get this job? He said, you have to study food science. And in my rural town, that meant I had to study agriculture science. And as soon as I enrolled in my first agriculture class, I was hooked. I knew it was the place that I needed to be. Oh, that's great. That's great. Okay. So uh, I didn't mean to interrupt uh, your answer about the barriers to entry to others, but go ahead. Yeah. So I think it helps set the context that I didn't grow up in agriculture. So I face a lot of the barriers that we see as emerging trends. So the primary barrier when my husband and I started our farm about eight years ago was access to land. A lot of this comes back to finances, but in the United States, we're going to see about 400 million acres of land change hands in the next 10 years. Land ownership is significantly shifting worldwide. And as a beginning farmer, you often get your start by leasing land. And while that's a fantastic way to get access, leases lack some stability and some certainty. So when you're looking to grow into a profitable and a sustainable operation, banks or loan officers are less willing to finance kind of an operation that works with that without a guaranteed land base. So I think access to land is interesting. It is is the primary barrier that we're seeing. And the finances that surround that are, is the halo effect of of that barrier. Elena, let me move over to you um, because through the the FAO, obviously you work with young uh, farmers and others in agriculture all the time. And you're looking at that generational transfer. Uh, Before we get to that though, because you are with FAO and because I did make some comments at the outset about the crisis in Ukraine, and you have a global view on on the food situation. How concerned are you that this conflict will add to the many others around the world and aggravate, make much worse, the 800 million plus people who we now know are already food insecure? Are you real worried about what's going on over there? Um, Yeah, Frank, I think this is something very important to pick up again. Thanks uh, very much for passing on the floor. Obviously, I am or we are, if I'm speaking on behalf of the Food and Agriculture Organization, we are devastated what is happening in Ukraine. And it's like, when you think uh, it can't get worse, it actually then Ukraine happens. And um, after COVID-19, so we've been struggling with the pandemic for more than two years now and other humanitarian crises that are still going on. It really poses a huge concern, um, not only to us, but to the global population. And I think something that I would like to raise is that no one should look away because lots of the things that we are eating, that you and I are eating, they're actually, um, a lot of goods are coming from Ukraine. For example, Ukraine is the first um, exporter for sunflower seeds, for example, for grains. And especially when we're looking to the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, they actually received a lot of food from there, like grains, rice, um, So basically, I think what is happening now will impact the whole world uh, for the next for the next decade. Now, that's that's very sobering. And what are you as an organization or what are you hoping that others who may be watching this or other organizations can be doing at this point? Or is it too soon and we just need to see uh, a little bit more where the dust settles? I mean, it all happened not out of the blue, but it was like all of a sudden. And I think the most important thing now is to stick together, to mobilize our forces, to donate to serious organizations that can help the people on the ground, because um, I think this is where the help is really needed right now. And to send food packages, for example, we're also working very closely together with the Rome-based agencies, which are the Food and Agriculture Organization, but also the World Food Program, which is an operational organization, and also EFAT, the International Fund for Agriculture. 
Alina, thank you very much for that. I think those, those were very important comments and observations for you to make at a very difficult time. And good luck to you and everybody at FAO and elsewhere with the work you're doing on this. Uh, to our topic at hand now and, and thinking about what Mustafa talked about from his perch in sub-Saharan Africa, what uh, Bev talked about from kind of both her sort of the American view, but her, her global view as well. What do you most hear from young people who want to get into agriculture in terms of what they need to actually make that happen? Yeah, I think I can just re-echo what my colleagues um, have been saying. So I think the access to land is something that is very crucial. Obviously, in different regions, apply different rules. Uh, for example, in a lot of developing countries, especially also in agriculture, I was just co-authoring a publication on small-scale food producer youth and how they can, let's say, promote the mitigation of climate change in their countries. And there are a lot of exceptional youth with a lot of ideas, but there are also cultural differences. For example, a lot of women don't have the rights to own land, even though, and this is actually the fun fact, most of women work in agriculture and are managing basically the farms. So this is also a very huge barrier. And then even if young people have access to land, they don't have access to local markets. And we're just talking about local markets, not even regional, national, or international markets. This is basically something that is very, very difficult. And one thing I've been following up on a regional workshop with FAO where young people have been asked, oh, what is the barriers you have to enter and to engage in agriculture? And one woman, one young woman stood up and says, you have to make agriculture more sexy. In a way, you have to make it more appealing, how you sell it, but also how you can attract young people to engage in agriculture. This was something that is still sticking in my head. <laughs> Mustafa, <laughs> is that true? We have to, I mean, do you find that your contemporaries and young people there, we have to make agriculture more sexy to bring them in? What, what, yeah, yeah. What's, the, what's the draw? Definitely. Um, so... Um, I, I very much agree with um, what um, Lina, um, Alina is saying, because in, we need to make agriculture sexy. Let me give you one example here in, in Ghana, right? Um, farming is used as punishment for most kids in school. So let's say you're, you're in school and you, you need to, you do something wrong and you need to be punished, you'd be asked to go and work on the school farm. Right. So that has, you know, over time created this mentality that oh, farming is, is you know, it's, it's hectic, it's, it's um, a lot of work, it's bad and, you know, it's for older people and all that. But I think now we're, we're trying to see more of um, a trend in, you know, using technology to help farming. People are fascinated by, okay, um, our mobile application, for example, right? They would see the mobile phone on a farm and they'll be curious what is going on? What's, what's the farmer doing with the mobile phone? They would see drones flying over farms and they'll be curious. I think um, if we approach it from that perspective, you know, um, I think we can really make agriculture um, attractive to a lot of young people. I think that's, that's a very powerful thing that you just said too. The idea that in some fashion, farming or work in the fields is used as punishment and is associated in a negative context. Now, have you taken that to um, school leaders and other leaders and shared that as an observation? Are they responsive to that? Yeah. So um, I just, I am the World Food, I am a World Food Forum champion, and that is what I'm looking my role as the um, new champion. Um, advocacy, going to schools, um, talking to people, starting gardens, backyard farming, and all that. I think through that shift, and my work as the food forum, World Food Forum champion, I think we can, we can make an impact in that as well. And the other thing that I picked up from your comment a minute ago, and I'd like you to talk about this and then Bev, come over to you because I, I think this is so interesting. And I've heard this uh, in, in so many contexts, that one way to make agriculture sexy to younger people is this technology tie. Show the technology, whether it's a cell phone or an autonomous, an autonomous combine or whatever, and that is very appealing and attractive. Do you find that that is uh, a successful way to talk about farming? Because you can have all the technology in the world, but you've still got to get out there. You've still got to be in the sun, be in the rain, worry about the weather. This is very hard work. 
Yeah, um, definitely it is. But um, for a lot of young people that talk to me and see our work, they are mostly fascinated by what they see and you know how fun they, they, they perceive it to be. Let's take uh, flying drones over farms, for example, right? Crop monitoring. A lot of young people wouldn't mind just fly, the activity of flying the drones alone. It's like that is enough fun for them, right? So they don't care, you know, going out on the field, flying. Uh, that is it in itself fun to them. So they don't really mind, you know, what comes um, after it. And then also using technology to, to promote, you know, their youth's um, involvement in agriculture. I think it's really a method um, that, that works. In a sense, it gives the youth the, 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 this idea that, okay, you don't always have to be on the farm. There are, you know, other, um, other roles that you can take up to be able to, you know, make an impact in, in the food um, systems, right? You don't always have to be a farmer. You can be, um, in our case, a farmer leader, right? So if you have a smartphone, you can use your smartphone to help a farmer. You don't have to be on the farm. You can use your smartphone to help a farmer sell. You can use your smartphone to improve the agricultural value chain as well without even being on the field. Bev, what do you, Bev, what do you think So there are, you know, success. So mine may be an unpopular opinion, and I'll be interested to see what reaction this causes in the chat. But I feel like the narrative around using digital technologies um, and the cool, what we've been calling the sexy things about agriculture is a good entry point to recruiting people into this industry. But it's dangerous or short-sighted to ground our entire strategy for how do we bring in the next gen just in this single topic. So one of the themes that I noticed as we all answered those barriers to entry question is access. Access to land, access to financing, access to resourcing. Getting those technological advancements on your farm require land, resourcing, and financing. And so we have to be sure that we're grounding whatever conversation we're using to bring the next gen into the industry deeper than um, what I would consider a surface level asset. I think there's a couple, there's two real pervasive narratives that kind of float around in the ag industry that are actually damaging. So we see all of these industry associations or even our fellow farmers, um, focus in on two concepts. So one is this idea that farmers have to be thanked for the work that they do. But then the other concept is that consumers have to be educated um, about the industry. And no other industry in the world focuses solely on educating the consumer. And I don't wanna monopolize the entire conversation, but I think it'd be, very inter it'd be an interesting process to go through how those two statements aren't necessarily a harmless sentiment, but it's pretty hubris. And in order to meet the themes of this panel, high tech, next gen, sustainable agriculture, we have to be thinking about what that true narrative is that's deeper than surface level what's exciting and happening in the industry right this moment so you're you know that, that that's a much more complex conversation that you're calling for are you saying that you think that this idea of technology i don't know i'm almost thinking in my head that if if i follow what you're saying it's like a lot of other things where you can you know life is a video game and that's all it is and you know, it gets back to the question I asked earlier about this is really hard work too. So are you suggesting that we misrepresent the, 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 what, what it means if we focus on technology or are we just not representing it fully? What are the implications here for you? So the way I look at the stories around technology and agriculture is that they're a way in. They're someone else's version of a Burger King chicken whopper for me. That's the hook that gets them into the industry. But we have to showcase that there are deeper reasons to be a part of this industry. And those are going to be longer term. They're a little less sexy. Like when I review my financial report for the month, I know that that's why I'm staying involved in agriculture. I like this business. I like this lifestyle. I feel purpose and pride in the work that I do. And it's an industry that's going to be around a long time because people have to eat and clothe themselves. 
And I challenge all of us as communicators and storytellers to use those, those hooks to bring people into the industry, but make sure we're building a deeper conversation and a deeper connection so we have a sustainable workforce in this industry. Alina, I think you're having a little bit of difficulty and I hope we got you here because I wanna to come to you. Um, but what we've been talking about is, is what brings people in and what degree we use technology as that, as that draw. And we're going to have very different experiences in different parts of the world, you know, and as Mustafa was saying, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's principally smallholder farms. In the United States, it's not principally smallholder farms and certainly not smallholder defined in the same way. H how do you see this? Okay, I hope my screen doesn't turn off. I don't know, it was some uh, internet connection issue. Okay, a lot of uh, things um, have been said. So I think Bev is right. Oh, sorry. I don't know. I can't influence this. I hope you can hear me. Okay, we certainly um, can hear you and perhaps we'll come back. Great. Right. <laughs> and I understand her concern, but I think here it depends also where you stand, what age you have and what goals you have and what kind of capacity that's true but i think with technology access to markets access to lands it's a little bit like with the sustainable development goals it's all intertwined it's like you cannot um educate someone without integrating in innovation if you want to create sustainable agriculture if you want to transform agri-food systems so I, I i totally get the whole picture and if i can go back to the struggles of access and the struggle that youth is facing especially when it comes to where to set the foot and um, mustafa was also in introducing himself as the world food forum champion and if you allow me frank i would just um tell the audience what this is so basically about uh, three years ago, the Food and Agriculture Organization um, got a new director general. And as one of the priorities, he made youth involvement um, something that was very important on his agenda. And based on this idea, um, the, the so-called FAO Youth Committee was founded with the aim to um, foster career development of young um, FAO stuff, but also to monitor which at this time wasn't really existing to monitor youth inclusion and youth involvement into the different technical projects because FAO has a lot of complex and technical projects where youth um, representation was lacking. And based on this, the FAO Youth Committee conducted a huge survey to understand what are the difficulties that youth are facing around the world. And it resulted that most, most of the external youth and youth initiatives had difficulties to approach the food and agriculture organization, to approach huge international organizations because they didn't know where to set foot, they didn't know who will be the focal point. And based on that, we launched the World Food Forum, which basically serves as a platform that aims at connecting youth and international organizations because we wanna work with youth and not for youth and youth should determine also the agenda. So basically, um, one of the barriers is to approach technical organizations to get the knowledge, to have the network, to understand where to where to reach out to. That's great. Let me try to and turn my... Alina, no, let, me, let me make a suggestion here. Um, I'm going to kick what you said around to the others, and there's some comments we've got, which I'd like to ask the others about. Why don't you uh, log out and then try logging back in, and then because we'd really like to see you as we hear you, and maybe that will work. Okay? Sure. I'll give be back a, in a second. Give that, give <laughs> bye that bye. A try. Mustafa and, and Bev, we've got some interesting comments in the chat. Jonathan says, I agree with Bev. How many farmers around the world could even afford drones, uh, GPS driven tractors, combines, micro irrigation systems? Um, uh, Dr. Pru says, uh, I resonate with what Bev says that youth do not have a clear view of the range of occupational tasks performed in agri food jobs. Tech is part of it. Uh, but there are still diverse skills and ways of working. We've been trying to increase visibility of authentic career paths with some campaigns that we're working on. Um, Bev, what do you think about this? What, 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 is, the, what is the response? If you, if you could calibrate this, and again, we're having a very big conversation here and the experiences of people in agriculture in the United States are entirely different than in virtually any other part of the world. But what is your sense if you're trying to con convey the the whole thing, as some of these comments are, how would you do that? 
It's a tough question because like most things in agriculture, it's very situational. What happens on my farm is even different than what happens on the farm that's next to me. But if we think about the way that we've been able to increase access to things um, in the past 100 years, so that's access to resource and education, that's access to trades and mar trade, trading markets that haven't been available. I think technology is the next thing that we're gonna be able to see enhanced access to. And while we're building that journey of how to increase access, we'll be able to build the, the factors that make it affordable, that make it usable. And I think people like Mustafa are already on the front lines of doing that. I know when I was reading about your AI inspired extension agent, I went and I talked to my extension agent and told him how excited I was by this. And immediately we were caught up in like an hour and a half conversation about he could use that in his office today. So I know I definitely want to hear more about that work that you're doing there, Mustafa, because I hope that it's going to be on my farm in the next six months. Gee, I think you've got an initial public offering there, Mustafa. I'm not sure about that but there could be something really big here. Mustafa, could you talk about this technology and, and in, in, in the context of smallholder farms and the younger farmers and people who want to get into agriculture that you know, what are the, 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 the technologies that are most in need? So, um... With, with regards to all the farmers in Ghana or the, the West African subregion, um, I think most farmers lack access to information. Like access to information. That is one key component. Exactly, right. Access to information, right? So if there's something going on on my farm, I need to know and then act immediately. That is, so any, any technology that's, that seeks to um, bridge that gap between farmers and information, I think it's what is really needed. Um, and in our case, um, we are bridging the gap between farmers having um, access to information regarding pests and then taking immediate action as well on their farm. Yeah. Mustafa, another thing that comes up, it hasn't been referenced too much in the conversation here, but when I talk to uh, young people and young people who want to go into farming, some of them who are already in it, is the, is the idea of sustainability. Um, doing something that recognizes the land, recognizes the planet, feeds people in a more sustainable way, contributes to that. Is that a theme in with, with the young, um, with youth that, that you're working with in agriculture? Yeah, um, I think this definitely resonates with a lot of youths um, across the world. Um, people are becoming more conscious, people are becoming aware of um, how the uh, daily activities you know affects um, the world and, and, and our environment and all that and definitely agriculture isn't out so in our case um with, with, the, with the technology we are we are building we seek to cut down on the amount of pesticides that farmers use right so and we have a lot of interest in what we do um, from youth as well so using our technology um farmers are able to cut down on um, pesticides and also using using our um, other services, they're able to cut down on the amount of fertilizer they use and they're able to save water as well. And these are really important when it comes to the conversations on sustainability and then um, saving the planet. Yeah. Alina, I mean, you work for the United Nations, I mean, indirectly, one of the agencies anyway, FAO, and we have the sustainable development goals. Um, how much is sustainability, the connective tissue between young people and technology. Okay, here I am. Well, I mean, it's very important. And if you can, if you also look into the different um, youth movements, for example, Fridays for Future, um, you can see that a lot of young people have very innovative ideas, but I think I think one thing that we also need to raise with senior experts, ministers, governments, that it's not just making noise and skipping school. There are a lot of people that really wants to be heard. Right. And I know that they have a lot of great ideas about sustainability. And to be honest, sometimes I just see they understand the issue and the importance much more than maybe people from a, let's say, older generation. 
And um, for example, under the World Food Forum, what we're trying to do is to include youth, to work with youth. For example, now we're launching our Young Scientist Group where people can apply to bring in very important innovative ideas how to transform our agri food systems. But it's not about only ideas, Frank. It's also to translate these ideas into actions. And this is where, for example, the education track under the World Food Forum looks into, into these behavior change science. So how can we, and starting at a very young age from like primary school, raise awareness for sustainability that really translates into action? Because I think this is something very important for the future. Yeah. Bev, you want to weigh in on the sustainability thing? And then I want to go to questions. We got a lot of questions from the audience. <laughs> and I encourage you to bring some more. If we get a lot, we'll just go to lightning round and get as many of these in as we can. But uh, why don't you take a take a pass at this issue of um, of the role that sustainability plays in, in drawing uh, young people to, uh, to agriculture, if it does? I think it does. I think the topic of sustainability has been a part of agriculture for tens of thousands of years. But in the last 20 years, there's been a really interesting spotlight on that aspect of our work. So if you think back 10,000 years ago, ancient South American cultures began breeding teosinte, and now that has become our modern day corn. They were doing that because they were able to make their land more efficient. They were able to reduce the inputs it took to feed their villages. And every time an agricultural industry has made an innovation, it's been an advancement in sustainability as well. And so at farmers live in this really interesting paradox where we balance, how do I get as much yield? How do I accomplish feeding the world and the planet while also balancing the needs of my land, balancing the needs of the ecosystem and the biodiversity that makes my farm effective. And so while farmers have been, I would call them the original stewards of the land for years and years, the current generation is doing a significantly better job in using those aspects of our practices in order to market the products that we produce and develop. It's also helping us address a lot of the sustainable development goals and put real tangible numbers or real tangible KPIs of how much carbon am I sequestering on my farm and how does it help me hit this standard? Right. Right. And how much renewable energy am I generating? And on and on it goes. Okay. Let's go to some questions from the audience now from the group that's gathered because they're great. Some of them I'm going to let you all answer because I think they're interesting. And some of them I'll direct so that we can get through as many of the questions as we possibly can. Okay. First one's a great one. What could we do to change the image of farming from a trade to a profession? Who wants to try that for that one first? Bev? I'm happy to give it a shot, but I don't say I always live the things that I'm saying. So <laughs> okay, I, I can share that in addition to being full-time farmer, farmers, my husband and I both also have full-time jobs off the farm in order to support our farming practices. But I think the way that we transition this away from um, an industry or a profession that's deemed as simply manual labor or simply as Mustafa was showing as, as almost... Um, a punishment rather than a rewarding career is that we have to market. We have to talk about how agriculture helps us create new value. They market new value, they capture new value. And that's gonna do the same things for our industry that we've seen in the silicon industry or that we're seeing in, um, in engineering or aerospace. We have to market our industry in order to make it something people want to be a part of. Mustafa, is it a good idea to try to market agriculture and farming as a profession where you are and in your part of the world? Yeah. Um, so kind of going back to the points I was making earlier um, around, you know, making agriculture sexy. If someone wants to be a drug, right, for instance, that is, a prof um, that is considered um, a full-time profession, right? But um, if I want to be, if, if we're able to market, um, like Bev is saying, agriculture really wants young people and they find um, interest in that. And there's someone that wants to be a drone pilot and has interest in agriculture, then the person can combine the two and be able to um, produce more and also leave their passion as well. So I think um, merging, again, I'm going back to the controversial point, I think 
imagine agriculture with um, technology can, can really drive a lot of um, interest in um, farming as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alina, this next question is for you because I think it's, um, it's a good one and it's directed at you. It comes from Julie who uh, writes in, uh, last year's UN Food Systems Summit put a big focus on youth leaders uh, as organizers of summit dialogues, generators of ideas about how to make food systems more productive, nutritious, sustainable. How is FAO following up with these youth leaders to include them uh, in follow-up activities? Uh, thanks, Frank. I was a little bit fast as I was already responding to her question in the chat. Uh, Julie, thank you very much for this question. This is excellent. So one thing that also the World Food Forum is trying um, to work more closely with other UN agencies or initiatives. And I know that a lot of uh, youth leaders under the UNFSS are part of the youth action track of the World Food Forum. So we're uh, very present. We're in close dialogue. So yeah, I think there are already a lot of things going on and we're connected. Great. Um, I want to direct this next question, comes from Freja to both Mustafa and Bev. Uh, making agriculture more sexy could be a temporary solution, Freja writes. Would it be better to introduce agriculture at primary school level as a compulsory subject? Bev? Um, as an individual opinion, I think it is a fantastic idea. So I am a part of a network called the Youth Ag Summit. Um, and, you know, seven years ago, when I was getting involved in this, in this work, my concept was creating compulsory agricultural education programs um, at the secondary school level. I think primary is even more brilliant. But doing so in an urban school district near us saw that school having significantly increased scores for uh, sciences like biology, sciences like chemistry. And so creating foundational knowledge of science um, helps build on those greater programs. So not only is it going to help us recruit people into this industry, but it's going to help build more successful and more informed consumers who are filling all of the other jobs that work in this halo of agriculture, because we know that food is what keeps this world turning. Mustafa, what do you think? Yeah, um, I definitely agree with Bev. Um, and I think in, 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 in Africa as well and in Ghana, this can be easily implemented because it requires as little resource as possible. We just need to have the curriculum in place. Um, we can use as little land as possible and we can have, um, schools can have demonstration farms where they can, they can use it for um, the teaching. And I think, yeah, definitely. Um, Alina, we have a question here that's really quite provocative and I want to send it your way. Making agriculture sexy as a way to, as a way to attract young people uh, is fine, but it requires technology, which is capital intensive. What are your perspectives on agriculture investments for low resource people in terms of insurance, capital, equipment, land, and fair prices for food? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. And I have to admit that you catch me off guard as this is not my, let's say my realm, but there's surely a lot of possibilities. For example, I know that a lot of organizations and also partner organizations on the field implementing agencies provide financial assistance. There are a lot of, um, let's say, applications um, with fundings. The European Union funds a lot of projects, for example, especially for for young people in developing countries, this could be a way where to get um, fundings, for example, for your projects. And I'm very happy to investigate more and send it your way if you're interested. <laughs> but if I may chip in, if you allow me to also reply to um, your um, question before that, I think it's very important, and that is what FAO is also trying now, to bring in more perspectives from the ground. So to move away from this top-down process, but more following up on a bottom-up process. Mm -hmm. For example, we're trying to do participatory video trainings that really show the work of a farmer to bring a consumer closer to the farmer to really understand what's the life about of a farmer. What is the theory of change if we're implementing some proje projects that show foster sustainability, sustainable uh, landscape management, and so on and so forth. And I know that communication is not everything, but without it, we would not have anything. So, so basically, this is something that could help also to make 
to raise more awareness for the work that farmers are doing. Well, I, I want to say this, uh, you know, picking up on that, Alina, you know, Planet Forward is all about um, working with people to tell stories, to be able to capture narratives and convey them. And I think that's a, a theme that runs through this too, is how do we, how do we talk about this? How do we tell the stories that will um, excite a young person's imagination, that will help them imagine themselves doing this kind of work, that will um, engage them in this space? And, and Mustafa, maybe you, maybe you want to talk about that. How do you how do you tell this? How do you talk about this with your peers? How do you tell the stories that might get them excited and interested in doing this? Yeah, I think um, in our case, first of all, it would, it would have to um, start with um, clearing the negative uh, um, notion that is attached to, to, to farming. Farming being for the older generation, farming being um, a lot of hard work and, and, and all that. So after we, we are able to have that conversation and clear that off, I think we can really bring in the, um, the we, we can begin to have the conversation around, you know, how much um, value you, you, you can have from farming, how much um, impact you can create and how much contribution you can make to the, the local economy as well. Dev? So I think a core tenet around really successful storytelling is to figure out what's in it for the listener. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons why people start listening to a story and then continue listening to that full story is they are able to say, here's what I can get out of it. And so when I'm talking to other people about why they should be invested in agriculture or why they should support specific agricultural practices, my first go-to is to share the opportunity with them. One of the really unique um, opportunities that's been available in my journey in agriculture has been international travel, international exposure. People want to go to new places and meet new people. And if I can help them identify agriculture as an outlet to accomplish those goals that they have, that's going to be something that has them dig a little deeper each time. And if I think specifically, there's this new work that's coming out called Engine. It's the Next Generation Ag Impact Network. And it's all about creating a network of networks, getting the people together from these local networks or even regional networks and figuring out how we cross borders, how we think outside of our own fence rows in order to accomplish these big picture goals that are the SDGs. And I think showing people those opportunities is what's going to be the thing that gets them to put in the work to accomplish these things. Mustafa, I have a question directed at you from Rachel. And Rachel writes, I'm currently doing some consulting work for an organization in Kenya that supports mango farmers and in incorporating integrated pest management technologies and strategies to move away from pesticide use. Uh, one of the biggest barriers we found, Rachel writes, uh, is the lack of awareness and poor access to IPM inputs. So she writes, Mustafa, could you speak to IPM, Integrated Pest Management, in the context of smallholder farmers in Ghana, and maybe how to motivate farmers to explore more nature-based pest management solutions? Great question. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, great to work, Rachel, um, Kenya. So what, what we are trying to do around um, IPM is so this is how um, the, the application that we have works, right? So a farm is able to take a picture, get a diagnosis, and then get um, a 3D video of uh, explaining what the situation is, and then also how to, uh, the videos contain sustainable control measures as well. And we specifically made these sustainable control measures around low cost materials that they can find around uh, them so they don't need to go out to 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 buy um, a pesticide in the first place even if they 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 do want to they don't have the 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 means to to do that so we try as much as possible to limit um, the control measures that we 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 preach to these farmers to the materials they can find low cost and nature based materials they can find in their communities to be able to fight these pests yeah very interesting okay here's a really interesting question from Tom. Can farming be promoted as a business to be combined with others? And Tom writes, as Bev shows, she and her husband have other jobs 
Uh, so farming is a part-time or secondary business. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but that's what Tom says, Bev. Uh, the reality of many or most small farms in North America, actually, in developing countries, as farms become successful, they can start other businesses off the farm. And youth today, Tom writes, uh, are often having two jobs at play. Do we need to position farming as a business to combine with other opportunities? Might that, would that make it, he writes, would that make it more appealing to new farmers? Bev, since you're referenced in that question, why don't you take that first and then I'll move it around. Okay, great. It's a very complex and layered question. So I'm gonna try and address it all from memory, but let me know if I've forgotten anything. I think one fundamental mind shift that we should hope to implement in beginning farmers is that there, there can be a shift. A farming is a practice. It doesn't mean it's your job title. I think your job title is an agribusinessman or an entrepreneur that is involved in agriculture and farming. So farming isn't necessarily limited to people being out in the fields, riding their tractor with their hands in the dirt. I am a salesperson at our farmer's market. I'm an entomologist when I'm going out and I'm doing pest management. I'm an economist when I'm looking at commodity markets. And so I think instead of trying to sell this type of career as a side hustle or as a second job, we sell it as an opportunity to grow skills across almost every industry that's available. And you will own a successful agribusiness in your operation. I, I, I love that, Beb, and I want to stop you there because I want that thought to bounce off Mustafa because you know you're in a in a different place, smallholder farms, very different resources. How how what is your response to that? Yeah, um, I think obviously um, that is that is that is one way to go. Um, I was kind of I want to answer the. the speak to the question um, earlier. Um, you, we, we can definitely combine farming as, um, we can definitely combine farming with other businesses as well. Um, for instance, in Ghana here, if you're around, if, if you're a young person and you'd want to get into agriculture full-time without having, um, because you don't have access to land in the first place, you don't have access to finance, so you need to be able to create a source of income that can um, support your farming, at least for a while until you know you begin to see um, some some um, some progress, and then you can bounce off that and continue to do it full time. We're almost out of time here, but I just want to say that we do have one of our attendees who, in all caps, writes "agribusiness person." <laughs> so <laughs> that resonates. Alina, I have one for you. This is a really interesting question from Josh. He's, and he's in Canada and he writes, in Nova Scotia, Canada, we have a problem of aging farmers with no one to take over the care of the land. How might we introduce the aging farmers to youth that have a passion to farm? Any ideas? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think in this case, it's all about raising awareness. So maybe organizing even local events to bring the people together, because also in communication, what we're aiming at is creating a farmer to farmer knowledge exchange, information exchange. So basically that it becomes a sustainable wheel where no interference from external organizations is needed. This could be something. And then how to attract young people on how to raise awareness among the, let's say, elderly generation. I think it's all about also the tone of voice. Because for example, if you're an organization that tries to attract donors, you use a more emotional or aggressive communication. But maybe in this case, it's very important to underline um, the positive change. So transformation, uh, benefits, um, apply change, spark change, um, community. So I think this is something that would also resonate within older farmers, let's say, to see, okay, there's a young person that is motivated, it's skilled, um, it has trainings. So I think this could be a good way. I hope this answers your question. <laughs> We're very nearly out of time. And I'd like to ask Mustafa and Bev very briefly the following question to kind of wrap us up here. And I do want to thank um, everybody who has sent questions in and, 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 and uh, suggested talking points because they've been great. But very briefly here, so we can let people get on with their day. 
Uh, Mustafa, first to you. What most excites you about the future of young people in agriculture, technology, and sustainability? Um, there are some groundbreaking innovations in AI and that I'm particularly excited about. And I see so many um, applications in, in, in agriculture. That is one, one aspect that really motivates me. And the other aspect is the youth is waking up to the fact that we need to produce more. Um, I think that there's been a lot of awareness around, you know, the need to produce more food sustainably. Population keeps growing and we don't have, we, we do produce enough food, but there are still people going um, hungry. And that, that also creates an opportunity that I think the youth can have um, a lot of, you know, impact, a lot of advantages, a lot of, um, listen, if, if they really want to go into that. So those are the two things that um, really inspire me. Um, the advances in AI and then um, youth sustainability in agriculture as well. That's great. Bev? The thing that excites me the most about the future of agriculture is the attention that it currently receives. So we have 28 years before our planet hits about 10 billion people who will be living here. That means there's only 28 more chances to put seed in the ground and grow food to feed them. And that sense of urgency is what drives innovation. It's what's going to drive sustainable practices and it's gonna drive greater access to these resources that farmers need. So I love the attention, I love the spotlight and I would encourage everyone to continue to put that pressure and ensure that we achieve our goals. And, and I, would, I would chime in on that. And I would say that the reason we started Planet Forward was to engage young people in the conversation, this very conversation, and to say, Let's go find the innovators and the new ideas and the breakthroughs and those things that are exciting and tell those stories because we, there's a lot of bad news in the world. There's a lot of very depressing bad news in the world, but there are unbelievable people out there like the three of you who are working brilliantly and really hard and inspiring us. And Mustafa, I wanna be around to celebrate your 23rd birthday with you. Cause if you've done this much in your first 22 years I can't even imagine what you'll do in the next. One, never mind next 22 years. But um, to all of you, it's been a, it's been a great uh, pleasure and privilege to, to, to talk with you. I think we have a sense of where you see the future, where you see the challenges, the opportunities, how technology, sustainable agriculture comes together, and what some of those narratives can be that really can inform and inspire the future. So on behalf of uh, World uh, Food Program, of course, but also the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, on behalf of Planet Forward and on behalf of people everywhere, especially our thoughts to those in Ukraine. Um, thank you all for this discussion, for being so inspirational to our wonderful audience for joining us. Have a great day, good luck. And if you have any interest, I hope you do in learning some more about Planet Forward and seeing some of the stories people have done, including our Planet Forward FAO fellows, go to planetforward.org and check out the stories and share them with your friends. And please, please share the experience all around. Um, to all the three of you, thanks again. Really appreciate it.